Welcome to Slammed, a Boston Celtics podcast. I am Megan Annalini from WEEI, joined as always by Esteban Bustillos from GBH and Justin Turpin, also of WEEI. Our, our big topic this week, we want to get into the Drew Holiday extension because I think that that's something that's going to carry a lot of weight for this team going into the playoffs and also the championship window that we believe them to now be in. But really quick, we do have to touch on the loss that the Celtics suffered at the hands of the Knicks last night. And mostly because, you guys, the most bizarre column that I've read, I think, this year, sports column, and I say that respectfully because I really enjoy it, but it is bizarre, is from Mike Vaccaro. And he's a longtime columnist from the New York Post. But this is such a New York Post column that I sent to you guys this morning. It's called the Knicks dismantling of Celtics reminiscent of Giants late season clash with perfect 2007 Patriots. Um, I mean, it's a long title. I don't know if that's that's not like the snappy New York Post headlines that we're used to, but I'm sure that's for SEO reasons. Um, what do you guys make of the metaphor that Vaccaro uh, posits in this column about these Celtics being the 2007 perfect Patriots and the Knicks being the New York Giants coming in on December 29th back in that season as like, this is some a Harvard, I, I don't even know how to say this word, so I'm not even going to go towards it, but a prediction of things to come for the playoffs. It's, it's, does that make, so I guess, does this mean like Porzingis is Randy Moss in this metaphor? Uh, like how, how does this work all the way if, if we're, if we're playing this straight? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I feel like I I guess or would it be would I and Drew Holiday's Wes Welker? You that's know? probably either that's, way. That seems that, that, seems that feels like apt. a better fit to me. Yeah. Uh it's an imperfect metaphor for like a couple of reasons, right? I mean, if if first of all Giants, that the Celtics lost last night. <laughs> yeah. And if the Giants and Patriots played a seven game series respectfully i think the patriots win that that series um yeah it, it it's it's very much like a oh this is a new york post sort of story as as you mentioned um but it does get to i think the a broader sort of points of there may be some concerns uh that we've seen over these last two games uh with boston um even though if, if the metaphor itself is a little wonky i don't know what what do you think terp that's a horrible metaphor. I mean, it seems like it seems like just like an overly optimistic like Knicks fan. Like I don't I don't know if he genuinely believes that or he's just kind of putting it together. It's just a stretch. Like like you said, the, the Celtics like lost last night. They like blew out. They got blew out. They didn't even try. Like that that Pats game was a shootout. So I, I don't understand it. I really don't understand it. Like I think you're just overly positive. It's kind of a reach. But I I mean I don't like it. But it's it's a good read. So it accomplished the job. I'll just say, I think the main difference other than, you know, crossing sports and having it be a very imperfect metaphor, because as you said, like if the Patriots and Giants play that game, I think uh, at least uh, six out of seven times <laughs> the, the Patriots win that game. So right. it's it doesn't really measure up. But also, if you think back to that Patriots team, like that was a team. I think what the what the columnist is trying to get at is that both these teams are under a lot of pressure to win a championship. But what the Celtics are doing this year, like compare where they're at, I think they're just so over the regular season and have been for the last two weeks. And you can say that there's an issue with that in itself. Hey, like your mentality needs to be there and it doesn't seem like it was there against the Bucks, and it doesn't the other night, and it doesn't seem like it was there against the Knicks last night. Like, why bother getting off the bus? And I thought it was really interesting. Um, I know Charles Barkley went super in on Tatum and Brown on TV last night, but the comparison that he made to his own 92 93 Suns team that went to the finals that, sh that year and were like totally checked out at the end of the season, I think was like a more apt comparison. I think what the writer's trying to get at here is that, um, like the 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 Celtics are so good that they maybe they're entering all of this with a little bit of arrogance. And I think there's something to that. And the arrogance might be there because there is a part of the Celtics team that likes to get or maybe the media around it that like to hold up. Hey, how many times they've gone to the Eastern Conference finals and that they're always there and they're always in it. But the point is they haven't won it yet. And so 
I think there's a part of it where, of course, you're a little bothered by them basically not getting off the bus last night, and that's not great for the mentality. But big picture, this doesn't change any of my predictions for what the team's going to do in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, especially if you're looking at the Knicks, and we talked about this before, without Julius Randle, uh, I just don't think they're they're just not going to be able to do accomplish what I think they want to. Um, OG and, and OB's playing again, which is great, um, but they just they need somebody like like Randle to sort of complete their picture. Uh, I do think if he was back, if he was healthy, maybe maybe it's a different situation. Um, that that not being the case, I think again though, are, are y'all concerned that? They and, and Barkley did mention this this idea of like you can't just turn it on and off. Um, uh, that the Celtics are uh, at least these last two games have haven't seemed to be necessarily uh all there. It actually is kind of a common trend in the NBA. It's kind of weird though because the Celtics really haven't been in this situation since what the Isaiah Thomas years and they really didn't have that, they didn't have this luxury, they weren't double digit games ahead. But I was looking into it a little bit last night. Like the Denver Nuggets last year, they were nine and ten in their final 19 games of the season. The 21 22 Warriors, they were 10 and 11 in their last 21. The 17 18 Warriors were seven and eight. Like it, it happens. Like once teams have the seed locked up, it's and for a team like the Celtics, they've kind of built their success on this pillar of mindset and coming out every day and winning each game, winning each moment. And it's it's easy to get away from that when you're they really are meaningless. Like they're not running any offensive sets. They're not showing you anything because they're not trying to reveal anything for the postseason. Like when games are meaningless, they truly are meaningless. And we just haven't seen that here locally, like for a team that we're analyzing and watching that we really didn't understand how meaningless they really are because we haven't seen it. And I think that's just what we're getting to. So it's like, I think it's a matter of fatigue, but it's also like, they're not showing anything. Like they're just going five out the whole game, just jacking up threes. Like they're not running any offensive sets and they're just kind of getting through, getting to the postseason and staying healthy. And that should be the number one priority. And it is. And like the only people that really care are the people that are buying tickets. Like those people last night when the starters came out with a 28 or 29 point deficit, they booed. And I guess they would have the right to because they paid money and they didn't get that Celtic experience that they're looking for. So I think those are the people, the, like the only people that are really taking it like with this because everyone else is just like get out healthy and that's all that matters. Yeah. And look, health above everything else. Absolutely. I think you bring up a great point, Terp, which is not showing. And I think that's certainly what they were doing with Jalen Brunson last night because Brunson was just running down on everybody. And I think part of that is like, okay, they don't want to show how they're going to attack the pick and roll if they see that in the playoffs against the Knicks in particular, Jalen Brunson in particular. Um, so I definitely like buy some of that as a reason for why we're seeing games like we're seeing over the last couple of weeks. I just think that there is still a part of it where you're not a perfect team and there is an opportunity to work on some of these things if you're going to play all your guys. Um, it's one thing you look back at those stats with these teams that go on to win the championship. And it's certainly some of that is uh, reserving guys and load management and everything like that, that we're all extremely familiar with and that we're seeing to some extent with the Celtics. But I go back to the Hawks games that we saw a couple of weeks ago and it, the missed opportunity to work out some of your uh, final game execution struggles that you've had, some of the things with Tatum. And so, like, I, I think that there's a part of this where, yeah, some of it is mindset. Some of it is, OK, if you're not going to work on this stuff now, when are you working on it? You know, or is this something that you can just talk through and film? Is this something that is being communicated and you have so much trust in what vets these guys are that they're going to go out and be able to execute those concepts when they haven't repped them? Um, I don't know. I, I think that it's fair to ask those questions. But overall, I agree with you. Like it, there is a real importance to saying like we're not going to show out everything that we're going to do if we see you in the second round or in the finals, uh, yeah. Eastern Conference finals, I should say. Right. And I think the uh, only other thing I'd add on this, uh, just looking back through the record, I believe this is the only loss they've had to the Knicks all year. Um, every other game having much more meaning given the, wh where they were. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's I don't know how indicative it is of what a matchup between these two teams would look like in the playoffs. It was the fifth time they met, too. That was just crazy to me. Like they played two times in the preseason, then five in the regular season. That's insane. Seven meetings with one team is just crazy to me. Yeah, it'd be fun if they see them in the playoffs. I mean, I think that that's a interesting matchup. It'd be a lot more fun, as you said, Aslan, if uh, Randall was playing. But yeah, 
New York, Boston stuff. It's always good. Maybe we'll get more New York Post articles like that. Yes. I really enjoyed that. So shout out. Um, but let's move on to what I think is really the biggest piece of news that's come out in the last couple of weeks for the Celtics as we continue our uh, drudgery towards the playoffs with the Drew Holiday extension. Uh, Woj tweeted this, I think, a couple of days ago now at this point. Drew Holiday, he gets the four-year, $135 million contract extension that's going to keep him in Boston through the 27-28 season. Um, and he's the fourth player to, this is from Woj, uh, the fourth player to sign a fully guaranteed deal worth more than $100 million at a 33 or older. That includes LeBron James, Steph Curry, and of course, Al Horford. Um, here's a little, just a little piece of Drew Holiday talking the other day about how he feels about this extension. At the end of the day, I am glad that we got it done before the playoffs. Um, if it would have happened after, I still would have been happy. I still would have been locked in, but uh, just really, really happy and really blessed. How did it come together? Excuse me? How did it come together? Has um, it been an ongoing conversation? Yeah, it was an ongoing conversation. It was, uh, I feel like it was pretty, I don't know, I thought it was pretty easy. You know, um, I think mutually we kind of just came to an agreement and felt like this was what was best for not only me, but for the team. And uh, just hope it works. You know, I, I, I want to be here. I want to win multiple rings. And I've heard people say that here plenty of times. So I'm, I'm ready for that. So I'm going to assume that we're all in agreement that this is this is a really good deal. And this is what the Celtics should have been working towards over the last basically since April 1st hit and he was eligible for this deal and so I'm really happy that they got it done as quickly as they did and that it's not going to be hanging over him in the playoffs and that he's also not going to go to free agency where someone else can make a higher bid and snatch him up especially a team like the Sixers who would have the ability to do that well uh Esteban what do you think I I mean I think it's a great deal for uh, for holiday, I guess the the real question I have is just what this means down the road, right? Uh, obviously, Brown had his his supermax uh, this past off season. Tatum's going to be down the road. Everybody's trying to figure out what white what will happen with White. Um, I was listening to, to Scal on y'all show, and he, he you know mentioning Mayo that like who knows you know it, whatever the the t next NBA TV deal could mean is that. These teams have a lot, potentially a lot more money to deal with. So maybe that changes the things. Um, but yeah, just like, how do you pay all of these guys? I mean, I, I've loved all the jokes of everybody being like, Wick got the black card out and was just, he was just, he didn't care. He doesn't care. He just wants to win. He's, he's, he's charging, he's charging whatever it costs. Uh, and, and I, I kind of feel like that's what they're doing again, given like, this is the window spin right now. You don't know when else you'll have the chance, but it's just, I mean, what is the ceiling? Because every no team can just spend an infinite amount of money. So, I, I, how do you balance that will to win with there is eventually a, a stopping point for all the talent that you can acquire on one team? Well, get ready for thirty dollars beers and twenty five dollars chicken nuggets because that's what's that's what we're going to be looking at. It sounds like well, but, but that would be the Bruins <laughs> charging that, right? Oh, that would be the Bruins. Yeah, yeah that would be. So maybe not. So maybe maybe it's just you know what? that's the thing shop. is like when you're the Celtics ownership, you're you get a little lucky because you're renting, you're not owning, so you don't have to worry about all that stuff. That is true. So they're saving some money there. But in terms of like the deal itself, like I think this was a foregone conclusion that he was going to get the extension. Like the day he was introduced to the Celtic, Brad Stevens sat next to him, literally looked at him the whole time and smiled ear to ear. Like you knew he wasn't going to let that guy go. And I think everyone knew it was going to happen. It was just a matter of when it happened, how much he got and how they're going to balance it in the future. But in the short term right now, like you're looking at it, it's like that is now gone. Like you don't have to worry about that. You can just focus on winning. You don't have to worry about losing him at free agency, whatever it may be. You also get to keep the top six for next year as well. So you're guaranteed to have another crack at it with this group. And then after that, that's where things get sticky with Derek White and all that. But like the only the only people that are, are going to be unrestricted next year are Luke Cornett, no shape or set. So you're pretty much running it back. And Savima High Luke has a player option. So you're going to have the same team next year. And I think that's what kind of that's going to be something exciting. And Joe Mazzullo was asked about that last night. And he's like, yeah, that's good. It makes you comfortable as a coach. Like, that's a great point. And he looked so that that like that's going to give them some sort of reassurance moving forward. But like 
when it gets to the future with the new CBA, that's where things get confusing. And that's where like, you know, the Derek white extension comes in. So that's, that's going to be a little bit worrisome when we get to that point, but for the next two years, like you got, you got your team locked up and you got a chance at a team that was setting records all year and you get to run it back with them next year. Yeah. I'd say like it, my knee jerk reaction when I first heard this was, wow, Drew holiday is going to be old at the end of that contract. <laughs> But hey, he's the kind of player who I trust his health. And I mean that by like, I trust his conditioning. I trust his approach to the league and that he takes that very seriously. But he is a defensive guard, which is not the position that always ages the best in this league. I'd say to your point about keeping the team together for the next couple of years, it would have been really hard to replace him for next year's squad or even the year after that, if you're looking ahead. Um, That's not to take anything away from Derek White. Like, I, I think the TV deal money is maybe something that they're looking ahead towards and that they'll wait until after that, that they can try to work something out with White. It would be nice if he decides to take a team-friendly deal in this offseason, as uh, Brian Robb wrote about in Mass Live. But I don't, I don't know if that's realistic after who he's shown himself to be after the last year and a half and that that, that extension hasn't come to this point. So... You know, it's kind of just like a wait and see. But I think this shows that they're serious about this uh, championship window being beyond one year, that they're they're looking at this for the next couple of years and that Drew Holiday is going to be part of the core alongside the Jays. And I'll just say next year, starting five, I was looking at spot track. I think they're going to be making one hundred sixty three million dollars in next season. You're starting five. So. They better remain the best starting five in the entire league. I'll just shout out Nick Grosbeck. He just (laughs) has no fear. Like you look at all the other owners around like locally, like we're just, they're constantly being talked about because of their, how they're conducting their business and their organization. Like Wick Grosbeck doesn't care. Like he literally, like he stands by his words, like better 18 or we're going to die trying and shout out to him because like, that's the other type of owner everybody should want. I mean, I guess what I will say on that is that, it makes sense for him to spend right now, right? Because he has a lot of this hasn't, it's not overnight. As as we know, this team has been built up over years and they were very fortuitous with Jason Tatum falling to where he was in the draft and having Jalen Brown and then being healthy and working together and being able to pick up uh, Chris Stops and Drew Holiday for almost nothing uh, in the off season. So yeah, if there's a time to spend, it's now when you have this money. And I will say the other thing about Drew, uh, which, again, we've talked about, he seems like the perfect person that you want on the team where it's like he'll he's one of the maybe t- top five defenders, uh, guard defenders in the league, and he just doesn't care about his own personal numbers. He just wants to win. Like that's what every report on him is. Like, that's true. And a lot of people say they want that, but he actually is that. Um, so, yeah, he like – to to lock that that sort of guy up uh who can make your team better uh without worrying too much about himself uh it's it seems like a win win for everyone yeah his usage rates had a career low and he still got that contract so shout out to him like that's that's how valuable he is let's move on to take flight unless you guys want to add anything more in on that contract shout out All to him good? Shout, Shout out, to, out to him. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Drew Holiday. Um, so Take Flight is the part of our podcast. If you're just joining us for the first time where we go around the NBA and we sometimes dive a little bit deeper into smaller stories going on with the Celtics. And this is one story that has been all over the place from the Bucks game the other night in which the Celtics did not attempt a single free throw. They didn't get to the line. This is the first time in NBA history, the history of the association Zero free throws against the Bucks. Obviously, the Celtics were pretty pissed off about this. Um, looking at it, you, this has been a year of a lot of officiating drama, I think, between the players and the way that officiating has been going. That's kind of how I ran into this situation. Uh, Terp, I'll start with you here. What did you make of the zero free throws against the Bucks? Yeah, I mean, it's been a conversation, like you said, really since the all-star break, the officials have been swallowing their whistles and that took it to an extreme. Like people are kind of getting away from it. Like, unless you were really, really kind of paying attention and some people didn't care because the game's going quicker, but like you have a game that lasts an hour and 57 minutes on national television. 
that's unheard of. That's absolutely insane. So it just took it to a whole nother level. And I think a product of that is the Celtics only shot. I think it was like 21 or 22 shots in the restricted area, but that's enough to merit some sort of contact, especially when you're talking about like those superstar calls when the Celtics team is littered with superstars, like that's enough to merit some sort of contact and some sort of fouls. But I mean, I, maybe it also speaks to just how meaningless these games are, even to officials. They're like, all right, Celtics don't want to be here. Why do we want to be here? Let's just get out of here. Hour 57. Sure. Why not? Let's, let's, let's get out of here. But I think it does highlight that officiating issue. Like you said, like since the all-star break, the calls have been way down and that's kind of maybe in an effort to combat the scoring. Cause before the all-star break, the like offense was at an all-time high offensive ratings, uh, points per game, all of it. And now it's kind of trickling back down. I think maybe that's cause like we talked about it on this show, like the, uh, the NBA wants offense, but they don't want that much. They want there to be some sort of level to defense still. So maybe that's part of it, but it does highlight something the NBA is trying to do. And that just took it to an extreme. Uh, I, I just, it would have been really funny if this like had happens to a James Harden team, that would have been the funniest way for, for this sort of thing to happen. Uh, I just don't know how this is possible. Like anybody who's ever played basketball, like even like just pick up in at the local Y, like, it fouls is just that's just part of the game. I, I don't see like how you could call a game just without one team getting fouled. And and for 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 clarity, the Bucks only got fouled twice. Uh or rather they only had they only had two free throws attempts, uh, which still makes this the lowest combined free throw attempts in a game um in NBA history. Uh the previous record for combined attempts was eleven in the the Grizzlies had previously won a game where they only shot one free throw attempt uh, back in 2014. Uh, but still, like a zero for a team and only two combined is is, uh, is wild to me. It's the epitome of an overcorrection. And I think I understand the frustration of how it's happening in season. <laughs> I mean, like these games, that game held some weight for Milwaukee, not so much for Boston because everything's clinched for them. But it's just like... It's just stupid. <laughs> I get this. It's a stupid thing to happen in an NBA game. And so it's something that, you know, they're going to address all of this in the offseason and try to find some kind of balance between the crazy offensive numbers that we have talked about on this podcast before and basically not calling fouls. Like there has to be some middle ground, but you don't love the adjustment happening in the actual NBA season when there are there is other stuff on the line. Um But I want to move on to our next point because this is just something that we were looking at on our afternoon show yesterday, and I'm like pretty into this. We're we're only uh, about a week away from under a week away from the play in tournament starting, and am I wrong in saying this might be the best play in tournament ever? If you sit here today, um, or or at least uh, last night, this is what it was. So the play in tournament for the Western Conference would be. The Suns against the Kings, the Lakers against the Warriors. Eastern Conference would be Sixers, Heat, Bulls, Hawks. And out of all those, I think Bulls, Hawks is the only one that doesn't really intrigue me to like sit down and watch. How long we've been doing the play? Is it three three seasons now with the play in since 2021? Is that right? Yep. Uh, Yeah. Uh, It looks great. I mean, the, I think the one, we are probably particularly the most interested in is 76ers and heat um, playing for the seven seed, Uh, especially because I think who that whoever wins that or whoever, whoever, essentially whoever becomes the eight seed plays the Celtics. So there's a chance that like the Celtics see the heat in the first round, uh, which would be hilarious to me. Um, So I'm, you're right, Mary, I'm particularly interested in that. And I'm just like, Lakers and Warriors, uh, the two old guards. It's like the one last gasp. Yeah. Grandpa superstar showdown. Yeah. Yeah. And then the Suns and the Kings, who honestly kind of feels like a toss up just given where where Phoenix is right now. Uh, Yeah. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. I've loved the play in too. Like, I know there's been some backlash on it, but like, I've been a big fan of it. It just, it brings more competitiveness to the league, which I really like about it. And to take that like a step further, like you look at the conferences right now, like in general, like these next, this weekend and just closing out the season is going to be so much fun because especially in the Eastern conference, like nobody's seed except for the Celtics 
is set. Like everyone else is still battling. And we got Milwaukee plays Orlando and Milwaukee loses. I think they play tonight or tomorrow. They play Orlando on Sunday. Like Orlando could have a shot to take over the Eastern conference. And they would have had a better shot had they beat them the other night. But like this been like, it's been a great week already. And like, it's only going to get better this weekend because of the competitiveness of the league. So maybe that's an early reflection of the CBA where kind of teams are getting a little bit more competitive. And if that's what they're striving for, I mean, step, step in a good direction because this has been a good year. Yeah, I agree. Like, I mean, it's kind of ironic because the Celtics are just above all of the mess, but I do enjoy the mess. <laughs> like, you know, I, I, it wasn't so long ago that I think the parody in the NBA wasn't as fun as it is now, where it was like, okay, the first round of the NBA, who's even watching it is how it felt with the playoffs back maybe 15 years ago, because it was like, oh, everything's predetermined and you know who these teams are going to be. I think with teams like the Heat and they're mixing it up and, it, you know, it, injuries notwithstanding with some of these other teams, like it, the playing tournament can be super fun in a way that even the first round wasn't like 15 years ago. So I think it's been a big success. I'm looking forward to it. Even if it's not exactly these matchups, like I still think it's going to be a really fun round for everybody. Yeah, and I, I will say just too, I think, I don't know if y'all seen the like the list of scenarios that the NBA has like tweeted out of like, here's who could be in the spot right now. And it's 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 fascinating and it's it's it looks like just so much fun because like every seed has like four or five different teams right now who can be in that spot. Um, so yeah, it it makes it makes these last couple of weeks. And again, it kind of explains like what happened last night. The Knicks are furiously trying to secure their spot uh the celtics have done they're just kind of just like oh right we got to show up for a game tonight um you know looking up from you know the the squidward meme you know what i mean where he's looking up from the <laughs> from the from the sunbathing uh yeah so it, it's it's a lot of fun for everybody but boston uh it seems at this point Boston's just bored and over it. I think yeah. most of us agree. Um, who's not bored and over it is uh, Nemius Keita, our guy who we talked about this. Like we kind of manifested this for him. I think back in December, we were talking about getting him off that two way contract, getting him a big boy contract, which, you know, kind of flew under the radar with everything going on with Drew Holiday. But the team officially signed him on Monday. It gives you a little big insurance going into the playoffs. I don't think we're going to see him with any kind of serious uh, play time, and unless something goes disastrously. But what do you what do you guys make of this? I think it's a great signing. I mean, he's he's proven what he's been able to do during his time uh, in Boston proper, um, helping lead the main Celtics to a, a G League Finals appearance, uh, putting up some big numbers up in the north. I think it makes it makes total sense, and again, that seems like the one position where we said that throughout the season there needs maybe some more depth. I think the Xavier Tillman signing sort of changed the dynamic a little bit for him. If you know, if Tillman doesn't get signed, maybe we do see him in the playoffs. But I think still, just to have that insurance of of another big on on the bench, that's a that's a great look for Boston. Terps Real obsessed quick. with Tillman. Just so I know. love Tillman. I love Tillman. I like do. he. I sat next to him in the press box and he talked about Tillman for like 70% of the game. I love Tillman. I think he just, he could bring so much to the table. I'm a big fan of him, but I actually, Kata has been my guy. I've been all over Kata this season. And real quick, if there was an, G League Hall of Fame, which there might be. Kata might be first ballot. He was first team all G League last year. He was all defensive team, and he was runner up in G League MVP last year, only behind Jaden Springer, Celtic. So the Celtics know what they're doing with this young talent. And speaking of that young talent, with the new CBA that we've been talking about, it's so important to prioritize that young talent and develop those guys, especially with a cap constraint team like the Celtics. And I think they're taking a step in the direction with that, with Springer and with Kata. And now you have an extra big, because the reality is, is we don't know how much longer Al Horford's going to be here. Unfortunately, like that's just like, we all love Al, but that's, that's what we're, what we're talking about now. He's getting up there and now to lock in Kata, who has proven that he can be a viable big in the NBA in very short minutes. He's only played like 500 career minutes. So what he's been able to do in those minutes is pretty impressive. And I just think there is some things he can work on. Like sometimes his touch around the rim can get a little faulty. He likes to foul a little bit, which 
you know, all things that you can fix. And so I think it doesn't matter because they don't call fouls anymore. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah. No, it doesn't matter anymore anyway. But I I think I'm a big fan of him because I think he brings a lot to the table. Like he's just so active around the rim on both ends, which always is a plus. So I love it. And um, I'm excited. I'm excited to have him here for long term because like he proved a lot. And it's hilarious that the Kings let him go in favor of. Yeah. Yeah. Who who else goes in the G League Hall of Fame? What? Jay Lynn, Fred Van Vliet. (laughs) Yep, uh, Fred Van Vliet. Yeah. Uh, who who else? Who else is, who comes comes? Luke to mind? Cornett for good measure. Luke Cornett. I like I like that idea. Paco Just, Ball. Oh yeah, yeah. Although you're not not as successful as an NBA, a proper NBA career. But just the, the just guys. the presence. You just know? the yeah. presence. Would yeah. Would Tremont Waters be in there? I'm not sure what he did in the G League, but yeah. I know he was I, there. Yeah, I, I I talked to him once when he was when he was in Maine. Uh, quiet guy, but he but he was nice. He was nice. I like that idea though. We that's we should do that. There there should be a G League Hall of Fame. Uh, that's actually a funny. That's that's it's a really fun uh, mental exercise. He should be in there. Kata like should it. be in there. He's I he's like a stud. It. He owns it. He's a yeah. he's a man amongst boys down there. All right, one more thing here on Take Flight. <laughs> Who threw this in? Esteban, did you throw this in I with did. the Tory Craig? We're gonna call it the Alley Oops. <laughs> Ooh. What he tried to, what he wow. tried to do on his fast like break. That. Uh oh my god. So just walk us through this because we got the clip, but uh Esteban, why did you feel like we needed this in Take Flight? <laughs> just because I've never seen anything like it. So Tory Craig. <laughs> Uh, gets what looks like should be a pick six down the court, uh, steals the ball, goes completely empty lane, um, could pass it, just could go for the easy layup, decides to alley-oop it, what looks like to be himself. His teammate, he throws it off the backboard. <laughs> right, right. His teammate, Andre Drummonds, who, as a center, I can maybe understand why he would think of this, uh, sees the oop, and he's like, oh, those are usually for me. Let me get that. Craig comes in. He he's going up for the dunk, and then Andre Drummond comes behind him. Uh, and the the still frame of it is just incredible. It looks like uh, Tory Tory Craig has seen like a, a creature from Lovecraftian horror or something, <laughs> uh, an imperceptible monster that you can't even uh, comprehend. Um, and they, of course, they the the dunk just just blows up, and it. it it falls apart miserably. Um, I've seen people say this is like the perfect comparison for Chicago uh, this year. That's been a, it's been a rough year uh, over there for them. Uh, have y'all ever seen anything like this where two people are attempting a dunk uh, at the it same were, time? It actually what ca- came to mind for me is at the dog park when you throw a ball and two like retrievers try to go jump on it at the same time. Like that's what it was giving to me was like two golden <laughs> retrievers jumping on the ball. Like they're both like, oh, that's mine to get. <laughs> yeah. Maybe this should be because we, we were talking, we've been talking about like, oh, the dunk contest needs fixing. Maybe this should be the dunk is two people dunking it at the same time with one ball. That's <laughs> like, but pull it off, but pull it off for it in, in real time. That would be and impressive. It's like unity. <laughs> yeah. That, that would be impressive if, if, it would have actually happened, but what if they each was... put like one hand on it? Like they each had oh. one hand, and they ch- they both put it in together. I mean, whoever I like if, if it was like Tatum and Brown that did that, Celtics <laughs> Twitter would be on fire. Like we would <laughs> never explode. we would never hear the end of it. Like Twitter, like it, it might have to rebrand again because Celtics Celtics Twitter would just go crazy. But yeah. that was that was insane. I have never seen anything like that. I do think that kind of is a good like. That's a good synopsis of the bowl season. Like they just like and it's weird. <laughs> it's a metaphor. Like they have yeah, yeah. They have talent yeah. there, but they just they yeah. can't goofy. put it together. It's like goofy, and they have a good coach in Billy Donovan, like the Rosen, Vucevic, White. Like they got plenty of talent there. It's just they can't put it together. It's it's so strange. And I think everyone thought like they were gonna blow it up at the deadline, and they they just didn't. So I think yeah. we could expect some big moves in uh Chi Town this this off season. Yeah, well, it's been a funny. In... Oh, sorry. They just... no. go ahead, Esteban. I was just saying it's been a funny week for just weird NBA bloopers. Did y'all see Kevin Harlan last night and the Pelicans no. and the Kings? Somebody no. threw no. there was like a chicken wing on the court, and Kevin Harlan was live commentating the throwing of the chicken wing uh, on the court during the game. Uh, Love when he stuff. does that. Incredible stuff. All right, I got to look that up. I I think we got to wrap the podcast there so I can go look up Kevin Harlan narrating a chicken wing. <laughs>
It was he great. does the best with those. He is the absolute best with those. <laughs> okay, well, that's the pod for this week. Uh, when we come at you next week, we'll have the play-in tournament, hopefully, to discuss and be looking ahead at who the Celtics may see in the first round. Thanks, everybody.